last week on the conception of faith. And in it, we talked about Hebrews 11, through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed when she was past childbearing age because, because she judged him faithful who had promised her. Anybody believe God is faithful? God is faithful. We're, we're, we're going to start out in Genesis today. This is the second deposit on the series. Genesis 1, 11 through 12. There's two verses, but they're very important verses. When you have it, say amen. amen. And God said, whenever you read that, It's a faith building, life changing. And God said, it don't matter what he said, the very fact that he stopped to say it means that he's gonna interrupt the situation and do something that's never been done before. Shout amen. amen. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind. Mm. The herb, God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself. Oh, God. God. Look at somebody say, I got something in me. Upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. So the turnip didn't bring forth pineapple. The grape didn't bring forth beets. So what God has set in place is a continuum of the creation so that every time you want grass in the yard, God doesn't have to say, let there be again. The perpetuation is brought about through the yielding seed. Look at your neighbor and say, I got seed. I got seed. Oh yeah, and everything is going to produce after its circumstances, after its situation, after its finances, <laughs> after its education after its beauty, no, after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Can you say amen? amen. We're going to talk about the conception of faith. We're going to talk about it from the aspect of seed. We want you to know as we go into this second phase, we started out talking about human conception, but this, this seed is a serious thing. Say that with me. Seed is a serious thing. Say it again. Seed is a Say it like you mean it. Seed is a if you're watching online, type it on the line. Seed is a serious thing. This, this will perpetuate, penetrate, and saturate all throughout the theology of the Bible itself is that seed is a serious thing. Let's pray. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us today. We thank you in advance for what you're going to do. Move by your spirit, great God that you are. We thank you in advance because we're loaded this morning. We came in here packing this morning. We're filled with your promises. We're filled with your word. We're filled with expectation. We recognize that seed is a serious thing. Have your way in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You can sit down for, for a while. <laughs> Let's go to work. We've often heard the cliche, which came first, the chicken or the egg? It is an impossible riddle to solve because if there were no chicken, there would be no egg. 
And if there is no egg, there will be no chicken. The redundancy of the argument suggests that there are two things, but in reality, the redundancy is seen in the fact that there is absolutely no difference between the chicken and the egg. So for all of y'all who have fried chicken and, 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 and eggs for breakfast, I hate to bust your bubble, but you're eating the same thing. My grandmama didn't have eggs. She fried chicken and rice and biscuits for breakfast. Y'all don't know nothing about that country kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, that kind of stuff that keep you going all day long. Yeah, and, and it seemed funny because I grew up eating eggs, grandma fried chicken. I didn't realize at the time I was eating the same thing in another form. Everything that is in the chicken is in the egg. Everything that's in the egg is in the chicken. You must begin then to understand what squirrel, squirrels understand. They run through trees eating trees. Mm -hmm. They eat trees. You, you might not recognize they eat trees. You, you say they eat acorns, but in God's mind, the acorn is a tree. <laughs> If, if the squirrel would leave the acorn alone, it would become a tree because you can only produce what you are. You can teach what you know, but you can only produce what you are. Genesis said, everything, every herb yielding after its kind. There you go, my after its kind. Amen. You, you produce what you are. God puts this in motion so that we would begin to understand that seed is a serious thing. I'm gonna lay some foundation because if we're talking about the conception of faith, conception requires seed. There can be no conception without seed. The seed in a marriage, the man produces the seed, the woman produces the egg. There is no conception without seed. In agriculture, there is no conception without seed. The conception or the birthing of faith requires seed. Faith cometh by yeah. and hearing by the, yeah, it comes by the word of God because God's word is God's seed. Whenever God gets ready to create, he opens his mouth and speaks. And God said, and God said, and God said, and it became whatever he said. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Now, we must understand then that while we come to church and we enjoy worship and we, we, we are commanded to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise, be thankful unto him and bless his name, the purpose of our exhilaration and our exuberance and our expression is to prepare the ground to receive the seed. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed. You got to be strong to receive seed. Especially if the seed is strong, the ground has got to be strong enough to receive the seed. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? In the Bible, the, the term seed is, comes from the Hebrew word zera. It's important that you understand that because from the very beginning in the, book of, in the book of Genesis, the Hebrew word for seed is Zerah. When you begin to understand that, like in Genesis 3.15, when it talks about uh, that the seed of the woman shall rise up and bruise the head of the seed of the serpent, God is talking seed stuff. While they are worried about circumstances, God is talking about seed. Their circumstances were not good. They had tasted of the forbidden fruit. They had lost the privilege of staying in the Garden of Eden. But they were concerned about circumstances. God is talking about seed. He said, Never, in spite of your circumstances, you're going to have seed. This is a seed fight. The seed of the woman will rise up and bruise the head of the seed of the serpent and the serpent will bruise its heel. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? 
So when you begin to talk about it, this is the first messianic uh, prophecy in the Old Testament talking about Jesus, that Jesus ultimately becomes the seed of the woman. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? So you begin to understand that God deals with seed. Now you need to understand that because if you're going to conceive faith, you are praying about objects and God is answering in seed. You're saying, God, give me a tree and then an acorn falls. And you say, Lord, I'm waiting on you to give me that tree. And God says, I'm through with it. When I, when, I, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I, when I, when I, when I gave you the seed, I had answered your prayer. Your problem is you don't recognize God's answers because God's answers don't look like your prayers. Come on, talk to me, somebody. In Christianity, this scripture is called proto-evangelism. It is very important that you understand that because it is interpreted as a prophecy of a coming Jesus, not here yet, but a coming Jesus, not chicken yet, but an egg, not, 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 real, not a tree yet, but an acorn. God is talking all the way back in the book of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, about a coming Jesus. God is talking about seed. God is talking about seed. Right now, the fight is over seed. The enemy is using circumstances to fight seed. He always has and he always will. Often the person who is carrying the seed doesn't feel valuable because the seed has not germinated. It has not developed. It doesn't look valuable, but God is concerned about seed and the enemy is fighting you not over what you got materially, but what you have potentially, what you have prophetically, what is in your life in seed form. If you don't get this groundwork, you're not going to get the message today. Look at your neighbor and say, I got seed. I may not have a company yet, but I got seed. <laughs> I may not be a wife yet, but I got seed. In fact, a woman is a wife before she gets married. If she wasn't a wife before she got married, putting a ring on her finger won't make her a wife. Neither will it make her a woman. It's just decoration. You might as well put anything on her. The Bible said, whosoever findeth a wife, findeth a good thing. So she was a wife when I found her. So all I did was acknowledge what she already was. Before we ever got married, she was in... She was in C4. I wonder what else you are in C4. The enemy is after the seed, but God will always honor his seed. Run over to Genesis 8, 22 for a minute. I'm going to show you this principle is consistent and it stays in the word of God and perpetuates itself in every area of your life. It is backed up in how the body is made physiologically. That if I skin my, if I, if I cut my skin right here, immediately my skin cells begin to reproduce after its kind and stitch itself back together and mend itself and make skin cells and replenish itself because God doesn't have to come down and do a creative act because the body was designed to produce after its kind. Stem cell research declares that if I get a cell, I can potentially make a kidney from a cell because if I have a kidney cell, it will produce after its kind. Follow me now. That which is spiritual is spiritual. That which is natural is natural. You are a seed. You are the result of a seed. You wouldn't be here if you didn't have seed. And if you're receiving this word, you are receiving seed seed. Genesis 8.22 says this, say, while the earth remaineth, while the earth, is the earth still here? Yeah. It's kind of hot, but it's here. <laughs> I don't know how long it's going to be here, but it's here right now. While the earth remaineth, <laughs> seed time and harvest, cold and heat, 
summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. It's never going to stop. It's never going to end. It will always exist. It is about the seed. Look at somebody say, it's about the seed. Psalm said, he that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. All of you people that wrestle with low self-esteem, the enemy is trying to talk you out of your seed. He doesn't want you to believe in your seed. Because if you know that you're bearing precious seed, if you know that you're bearing precious seed, you handle yourself differently because you got too much to lose. I can't act like somebody who doesn't have anything to lose because I am bearing precious seed. He that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. All right? I may not have a harvest right now, but if I got seed, harvest is on the way. Walk past me right now while I'm in seed form, but be careful who you step over because there's a harvest coming after my seed. Glory to God. Those of you that have been through abuse, been through trauma, been through ostracization and criticism, the enemy started early because he knew you were burying precious seed. He tried to dilute you. He tried to pollute you. He tried to annihilate you. He tried to destroy you. But you never stopped to think, if you weren't valuable, why would he be fighting you? Keep me hot. If you weren't, if you weren't carrying something, why would you be up under the attack that you're up under? The enemy knows that you are bearing precious seed. Something is about to happen in your life. Something is about to happen in your life. Everything you see God saying throughout the Old Testament and all over into the New Testament centers around seed. Not just he that goeth forth and bearing precious seed shall not let's come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. But it also says they shall sow in tears, they shall reap in joy. Anybody been doing some crying? Have you been doing some crying? Your tears aren't doing nothing but watering your seed. Your tears aren't doing anything but watering seed. The Bible said when you're in the sowing stage, you're in the crying stage. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about because you never gave anybody anything at any time, anyway, including God. But those of you that are sores, he that goeth forth weeping, 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 bearing precious seed. See the weeping and the seed, the water and the seed, they shall sow in tears, they shall reap in joy. Look at somebody say, it won't always be like this. You might be crying in March and you might be dancing in December. You might be crying in August. You might be dancing in February. It's not going in like you met me. You might have met me in my crying stage, but I'm coming into harvest. In fact, I'm watering my seed while I'm weeping. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. The reason Pharaoh was killing all of the firstborn is that he knew that a leader was coming and he was trying to kill the seed. The reason the enemy is after your children is because he's trying to kill the seed. The reason you're having so much trouble in your house is that he's trying to kill the seed. I want to talk to some folks in here that are battling for the seed. You're not even fighting for yourself. You're fighting for the seed. There's a war out for the seed. The seed of the woman shall rise up and bruise the head of the seed of the serpent. Somebody say, give me my seed back. It's a seed fight. You've heard of a food fight? You've heard of a pillow fight? This is a seed fight. 
When the enemy saw that Moses was coming, he started killing the seed and telling the midwives to abort all of the babies under the age of two. When the women, when the Hebrew women got ready to deliver and they got on the birthing stool, because back then they birthed on a stool, not in stirrups, they tried to abort the seed because if the enemy knows that he can cut you off in your early stages, he can stop you from becoming what is about to happen in your life. Look at somebody say, this seed is a serious thing. God told Abraham, I will make thy name great. I will bless your seed, and out of your seed shall come a great nation. Oh, Rebecca, when she was carrying twins, the Bible says she had two nations fighting in her womb because she was bearing precious seed. The enemy is fighting you over your future. You're frustrated over your now. The enemy's fighting you over your future. If you can believe that you have a future, you can step over your now and step into your destiny. The, the first thing he tries to kill is your hope that there is a future because faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. But if you don't hope for anything, your faith doesn't have anything. Somebody holler, I still got a hope. I've been to hell and back, but I still got a hope. I lost my car, but I still got a hope. I lost my friends, but I still got a hope. I lost my companion, but I still got a hope. See, hell is after your hope. Because if you lose your hope, I don't care how much I preach and teach the Word of God in you, your faith will have nothing to do. And when faith ceases to be hungry, then feeding ceases to be relevant. So when faith ceases to be hungry, then feeding ceases to be relevant. The only people who have any hope of receiving anything in this place today are people who are hungry. Are there any hungry people? If there's some hungry people in this house today, you have not lost your hope. Stop playing around in the valley of dry bones. Stop playing around in dead places. Telling yourself what you cannot be, what you cannot do, what you cannot have, that you're not getting better, that you're not overcoming, that you're not coming out of that. Because the enemy is using your word against you. Whatever you speak, you're going to birth. If you start speaking negativity, you're going to birth negativity. So the first place I want you to stop speaking negativity is in your own head. The second place I want you to stop it is in your circle of friends. You got to get away from people who use words like you can't, it's too late, you're not smart enough, you're not able, because you need to have strength to deliver what God has in you. Throw your hands up and say, give me more strength. I need strength. I need strength because I'm carrying some. I need strength to resist the enemy. I need strength to put up boundaries in my life. I need strength so that the enemies of this world cannot come in and destroy what I am carrying. You could not commit suicide if you had hope. You lose hope, you lose life. Suicide should never be a result of your past or your present because it cannot kill either one of them. What you do when you kill yourself, you kill your future. You kill the possibility of better. You kill the hope for tomorrow. You kill the hope for next year. You kill the hope of what's next. So before the enemy can get you to kill yourself, he tries to deteriorate your vision of what's next. 
So you drown in what's now. If you drown in what's now, you cannot see what is next. Faith coming by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. How shall they hear without a preacher? And how can you preach save you've been sent? You can have a PhD and not be sent. You can have a demon and not be sent. You can speak Greek and Hebrew and not be sent. You got to be sent to do this. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Let me take you into the Word a little bit deeper. Are you ready? Let's go. Let's go to the Gospel of St. Luke chapter 8, verse 11 through 15. I like this translation because I believe it expresses clearly. This is the only parable in the New Testament that Jesus does not leave us to figure out. He exegetes it himself. It is the parable of the sower and the seed. It was so important that Jesus did not leave it in parabolic form or mystery form. He explains it so that we do not violate the integrity of the sower and the seed. Because everything from Genesis to Revelations is built on the sower and the seed. Everything that you live in, drive in, wear is built on the sower and the seed. Everything that you will ever be is built on the sower of the, and the seed. The principles of salvation are built on the sower and the seed. You have to understand that. If the princes of this world would have known what they were doing, they would not have crucified the Lord because all they did was crucify the seed. Jesus says, I am a seed. Except the grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abide alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. So had the princes of this world know what they were doing, they would have never crucified the Lord. When they crucified him, they thought they buried him. But in reality, they planted him. And on the day of Pentecost, he harvested his seed because he is a seed. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying? There are some people that thought they buried you, but in reality, all they did was plant you. Slap your neighbor and say, I'm not buried. I'm planted. I'm planted. I'm pla that means I'll be back. <laughs> That means I'm getting up again. That means God is not through with me yet. That means you haven't seen the oak tree yet. That means there's a chicken down in this egg. Hallelujah to God. Keep everything warm because God is hatching me through what is hurting me. God is hatching me through what is hurting. It's about the sower and the seed. There is nothing that hell can do to stop the sower from sowing. The sower went forth, Jesus said, sowing seed. Some fell on good ground. Some fell on stony ground. Some fell up and started to grow up but had no root. Some brought forth thorns and thistles and the cares of this world choked them out. Jesus does not leave this up to any individual preacher to interpret. This is the parable he interprets himself because the sanctity of understanding this is critical to understanding life, to understanding salvation, to understanding the cross, to understanding your predicament, to understanding what's going on in your life right now, to understand what season you're in. You're either in a sowing stage, <laughs> a weeping stage, a buried and overlooked and people walking over top of your stage or a resurrection stage where you're coming back up in a form that looks different than how you went in. 
We often say you don't look like what you've been through, but it's deeper than that. You're not going to look like what you started out as. When God gets through with you, you won't look like where you came from. Some preachers, friends of mine, just recently went up to Charleston to do a revival. And while they were there, they went to two of the various churches that I pastored. And they were sending me pictures of the churches. And they were talking about how astounding it looked because they didn't know me then. They only know me now. And so they sent me pictures of the storefront. And the storefront looks nothing like the potter's house. So they said, how can all of this come out of that? Glory to God. You might not have everything you want. You may not be driving everything you want. You may not have the relationships you want. Your great-great-grandparents would have fainted over what you call normal. You talking about how hot it is? They didn't know what air conditioning was. Most of them didn't have fans in the house, didn't have cook stoves in the house, didn't have refrigerators in the house, didn't have uh, 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 toilets in the house, didn't have anything that you walking past like it ain't nothing. And the reason you think it ain't nothing is that the enemy doesn't want you to think you're blessed. So he shows you pictures of other people who have other things to talk you out of recognizing the blessing that you have right now, that you are living in your grandmother's dream. You are living in your great-grandmother's dream. You are living in the dreams that your ancestors could have never imagined. They would never understand what you're depressed about. Their babies were snatched out of their arms and sold on slave tables. Their men were taken and sold in other plantations, and still they stood. And still they stood. And still they stood. How in the world can you say, I can't take it, when you came from stuff that took stuff way worse than what you're going through? Slap somebody and say, I'm stronger than I think I am. I'm stronger than what I look like. I'm stronger than what I've been through. If I wasn't stronger than what I've been through, I wouldn't have come through it. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. If you fool with me, I'm gonna mess up and preach this morning. Something is about to happen in this place. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. News flash, I'm coming out of this. Somebody in the choir help me praise him. News flash, I'm coming up out of this. News flash, I will not die in this situation. News flash, I got more in me than what you see. Y'all sit down, because y'all ain't gonna do me like you did last week. You got to carry on, I got to carry on, and I didn't get out of my introduction. <laughs> my God. The sower and the seed. The sower and the seed. The sower and the seed. I realize that there are some people who pride themselves on the fact that they don't sow. They don't give. They watch and they don't give. They come and they don't give. They get married and they don't give. They have children and they don't give. I realize that they celebrate that. But God has a relationship with the sower, not the hoarder, not the keeper, not the spender, the sower and the seed. Come on, I'm going to go deeper. He said, I give seed to the sower. 
Where are my sores at? Make some noise. You ain't never got to worry about having some seed. Because as long as you are sore, you're going to always have some seed because God said, I give seed to the sower. I don't give it to the hoarder. I don't give it to the selfish. I don't give it to the narcissistic. I give seed to the sower. Throw your hand up and say, Lord, make me a sower. If you become a sower, you don't have to pray for seed because God will always give seed to the sower. I lived in a little raggedy house down in Dunbar, West Virginia. Two bedroom house, little raggedy house. Success for me was having all my utilities on at the same time. I used to go to Miss Anna Roy's house to use the phone because our phone was off. When it was on, the bill collectors was calling on it. Still, I entertained. I invited people over for dinner, didn't I? I'd go about it, down there and get that bag of chicken legs you could get. Some brown beans and some rice and fed everybody on a church table that I had borrowed from the church that you covered with a white tablecloth that was made out of paper. And even then, with wick, I was still giving. The reason I'm here right now is because I'm a sore. And if you are sore, God said, I'll pass over all of those stingy people and find somebody that's, I give seed to the, somebody holler, make me a sower. I'll never have to pray for seed if I become a sower. I'll never have to beg for bread if I become a sower. God said, I'm not giving anything to anybody that won't do anything with what I gave them. I give seed to the sower. I give bread to the eater. We used to go over to people's houses. They had plastic over their living room furniture. They tell you, don't sit in there. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It was that cold, hard plastic, too. It looked like a museum. Nobody sat in it. You walked past and looked at it because it was too good to use. They ended up with nothing because God gives bread to the eater. If you use it, he'll give you some more to use. If you teach it, he'll give you more to teach. If you develop it, he'll give you more to develop. The more you give out in ministry, the more that comes back to you. If you got revelation and you won't sow it, he won't give it to you. Anything you won't use, you will So all I have to do is talk you into not sowing and not eating and you won't get bread and you won't get seed because everything throughout the scripture is about the sower and the seed. The sower and the seed. The sower and the seed are the stable realities of the parable. The only thing that changes is the ground. I'm having such a good time this morning. I feel like somebody just put red hot on my chitlins. Yeah. You know why? I'm sowing seed. I'm sowing seed. I'm sowing seed. It's going to hit all kind of ground. Stony ground, stubborn ground, indifferent ground, selfish ground, carnal ground, hungry ground. That ain't none of my business. I'm just going to keep on. I'm going to keep on sowing the seed. 
because as long as I keep sowing, I don't care what kind of ground it hits, I'm still going to get more seed to sow. I got news flash for somebody. You're about to get a download of some more seed to sow. If you got a song, you better sing it. If you got a story, you better write it. If you got a gift, you better give. If you got a talent, you better use it. Because when you start using it, God will develop it. That's why the two fish and five loaves of bread could only be counted as long as it was in the bag. The moment you got it out of the bag and Jesus started using it, it started multiplying. Because God gives seed Little boy walks up, gives his lunch. What you got? I got two fish and five loaves of bread. Inventory, accounting has been done. Audit has been done. He knows exactly what he's got. Do you know what you got? Jesus said, you're about to eat your harvest. If you go over in the corner and eat those two fish and five loaves of bread, that's it. If you give it away, I'll show you what you really got. Not only will I feed the 5,000 men, not to mention the women and children, you, I, I will bless it so that you have 12 baskets full left. If you sow it, give it to me, and I'm going to give it to them. And every time we give it, it increases. And you sitting on your talent. Asking God to bless a hoarder. I don't have time to sing. I don't have time to serve. I don't have time to teach. I don't have time to do children's church. I don't have time to do the work. I don't have time to draw. I don't have time to write. I don't have, the more you say I don't have time, you're saying I don't have seed. Why would God give seed to somebody who's just going to brag about having it and not going to use it? Okay, let me get to this text. I'm talking to somebody, I don't know who it is. The seed is good. It's the ground we gotta check out. What kind of ground are you? Ask three people around you, what kind of ground are you? Sleepy ground, distracted ground, fearful ground, depressed ground, Frightened ground, angry ground, jealous ground, all of that stuff will stop you from harvesting in your life. That's why I forgive everybody. I had somebody come see me about something happened four years ago, want to know was I mad? I said, Lord, no. I don't have time to be mad over something happened four years ago. I had to get that out of my spirit. I can't let you mess up my blessing. I'm on the verge of a blessing. Be at peace. You might have meant it for evil, but God. Talk to me, somebody. I feel a praise about to hit this house. I feel a breakthrough about to hit this house. I feel a spirit of increase about to hit this house right now. Glory to God. Somebody that's got some faith say, I'm walking in abundance. I'm going to have 12 baskets full left. I'm going to have so much left, I'm going to have to figure out where to put it. When God gets to blessing and breaking what I got, I'm going into overload. I'm going into overdrive. I'm going into increase. Your eyes have not seen. Your ears have not heard. Neither have been it in your heart. The things that God has in store for them that love him because you're looking at the seed. Thank you. God's looking at the harvest. Thank you. Just 10 people say, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. <laughs> yeah, it's coming, it's coming. Come on, sow something, it's coming, it's coming. Type it online, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Type it online, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Type it, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. 
Let your spirit hear you say, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Let your emotions hear you say, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Let your circumstance hear you say, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Sir, I know you don't have but a few seats left, but I believe that there won't be a seat left at Woman Evolve. Don't settle for less than what God has promised. God said it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And when they come, they're going to have 12 baskets full left overload in the airport, in the mall, in the hotel, in the restaurants. Maids getting saved. People getting saved while they're making their bed. The power of the Holy Ghost is kicking in the overdrive. Let me get to this text. Come on, come on, come on. I got to get to this next verse. I got to get to this. I got to get to this before it explode in here. I got to get in here before we go into harvest. I see a bud and a blossom and a fruit about to come out of this situation. If I don't hurry, we're going to be in harvest. And I don't want anybody to be left out. The Lord just spoke to you and told you to sow. You better hurry. Don't get left out. Because when we go into harvest, it's going to be too late to plant. There is seed time and Watch this, sit down, sit down, sit down. Chill out. His seed is a serious thing. His seed is a serious thing. This seed is a serious thing. This seed is a serious thing. One preacher texted me and said, I can't believe it. Look at where you came from. I can't believe you. Nobody knew you. Nobody heard of you. Nobody saw you. This seed is a serious thing. They rushed past me. They pushed past me. Jesus, I come in a place like this. They knocked me down trying to get to the important people. They were looking for trees. I was carrying acorns. They were looking for chickens. I was in the egg stage. Hallelujah. Somebody that's getting walked past right now, God is getting ready to blow your mind with what he's about to do in your life. Something is about to happen. How many people have been feeling in your spirit something is about to happen? I know it don't look like it, it don't sound like it, they're not talking about it on the news. The New York Times isn't writing about it. Wall Street Journal isn't the one. But the stone that the builders rejected is about to be the chief cornerstone. God's getting ready to use the unlikely people in the world to do the most amazing thing. Who am I preaching to? Give me Luke 8, 11, 15. I got to get this seed right. I got to get this ground ready. This is what the story illustrates. This is what Jesus says. This is what the story illustrates. The seed is God's word and God said. Some people are like seeds that were planted along the road. They hear the word, but then the devil comes. He takes the word away from them so that they don't believe and become saved. Have you ever noticed that some of the best services, you come out of the service and something crazy always happens to get on your nerves and upset you? That's nothing but the enemy trying to steal your seed. Resist the enemy and he'll flee. Some people are like seeds on rocky soil. They welcome the word emotionally with joy whenever they hear it, but they don't develop any roots. They got feelings, but no roots. You know you got roots by staying power. I don't care how much joy you got, if you don't have no staying power, you don't have no roots. You need a rooting system. 
They welcome the word with joy whenever they hear it. While they're in church or watching church, they feel the feeling, but they don't develop any roots. They believe for a while, but when their faith is tested, they abandon it. Every time a storm comes through, I got trees in the backyard, and I, I forbid anybody cut any of my trees. I want all my trees. But when, the, when a hurricane or a big storm comes through, if a tree is not rooted correctly, the wind will knock it over. We'll have to cut it up into firewood because the rooting system wasn't right. If your roots run deep enough, you're exposed to the same wind, you may even lose some leaves, you may even lose some branches, but when the storm is over, you're going to stand right back up again because you're not counting on your leaf, you're not counting on your fruit, you're counting on your root. Anybody got good roots in here? The seeds that were planted among thorn bushes are people who hear the word. But as life goes on, watch this, 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 this trinity of thing that gets them as life goes on. They were planted among the thorn bushes. It's not the dirt, it's the environment. They hear the word, but as life goes on, the worries, comma, worry is a seed killer. The riches, how can you go after purpose when all you care about is profit? Uh-oh, I lost them on that. The dance just all stopped. That's how you know you got a harling because you don't care about purpose. All you care about is profit. The real test of riches is not having it, but giving it. That's why we tithe to break the curse of riches. Every time I bring my money, I let my money know I'm not worshiping you. I'm worshiping God. No matter how much you give me, God, you can trust me. That's what my tithes say. You can trust me. I'll let nothing separate me from the love of God. You can trust me. And I got to give lest the riches choke me. And the pleasures of life, this demonic trinity, the pleasures of life, I don't have time to go to church on Sunday. That's my golfing day. On game day, are you, are you doing man? It's a game today. See if the game can save you. See if the game can heal you. See if the game can give you a right mind. The pleasure, I'm nothing wrong with the game. Go to the game, TV or do whatever you want to. But if you allow the pleasures of this life to become more important than the one who gave it to you, then you are worshiping the creation and not the creator, the healing and not the healer, the blessing and not the blesser. This part's for people who are really blessed. Your test is your blessing. Oh, you blessed me when you were down low, but can you bless me up high? I ain't got time to go to church. I got a man to take care of. When you were single, you were laying prostrate on the floor. No, I'm not gonna say that, I'm not gonna say that. I made a decision not to say that. I'm going to let you finish it. So they don't produce anything good. 
because it got choked. The seeds that were planted on good ground are people who also hear the word. All have heard it, but they keep it in their good and honest hearts and produce what is good despite, despite what life may bring. Some of y'all are producing good stuff and people think you're in the middle of a good time. But the truth of the matter is all hell is breaking loose. But you still produce. I want a production praise that says despite what I'm going through, despite what I'm facing, despite what I heard, despite what you think, I'm gonna praise the Lord anyhow. 30 seconds for a stubborn praise, a radical praise, a break loose praise, a crazy praise. 15 seconds left for a despite praise, the sacrifice of praise. your neighbor, I'm still going to praise him. I'm still going to serve him. I'm still going to love him. I'm still going to be on my post. I'm still going to stand on the wall. I'm still going to read my word. I'm still going to pray and fast. Despite of what I'm going through, I will bless the Lord. I listen to people all the time. There are four, there are four classes, sit down. There are four classes of people. I'm almost done, sort of. You know, you get to close three times when you're preaching. There are four classes of people. I want you to get this good so you can figure out which one are you. Because it tells the kind of ground you're, you are. The first class, the enemy stole it before they could flourish, even to the point of salvation. You hear it, but it never stays. I listen to you all the time. But is it doing you any good? Did, did you let somebody steal it before it could flourish? That's the first group. Put that up so they can see it. The second group, the second group is important too. They are most deceptive. They fit in the service real good because they react to the word just like anybody else. The second group received the word with joy. Oh, you couldn't even have church. They just jumped up and down, stepped on your shoe, danced on your pocketbook, ran all up and down the aisles of the church. They received the word with joy, but don't let the joy fool you. They have no root. You know how you have root? You know how to test whether you have root? By how you react to the storm. If the test can fill your faith, can destroy your faith, you might have had joy, but you don't have no root. I'm in a season in my life, I cannot deal with people they have no root. You know those people that you got to call every day to see if they still who they were yesterday because they change like the weather back and forth. I don't have time to take your temperature every morning to see who you are. You have no root. I can't build off of you. I can pray for you. I can love you. I can like you. I can even have feelings for you, but I can't build off you because you don't have no root. 
Where I'm going, there's going to be some storms. Where I'm going, there's going to be some wind. Where I'm going, there's going to be some haters. Oh, yeah, it's got to be some haters to indicate I have arrived. You got to have some root. If you only stay with me in the sunshine and run in the rain, you can't be my friend. A friend is the person who runs in when everybody else runs out. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Oh my God, I'm preaching something this morning. So we covered two, we got, give me number three. The third group allows external circumstances to abort the promise. The three you gotta watch out for is worry. I won't talk about each one of them. Can I take a minute? Worry is negative faith. Worry is negative faith. Worry is to have faith in what you don't want to happen. Worry is faith turned inside out. Over and over in the Gospel of St. Matthews, Jesus says it over and over again, do not worry. Do not worry. This is not a request, children. It's a commandment. Because worry is a seed killer. Oh, y'all got quiet. How do I know when I'm worrying? When you keep thinking the same thought over and over again, that's worry. The first time, it might be reality. But once you know it, why are you rehearsing it? The more you rehearse it, the more you magnify it. I don't want to keep talking about what we already talked about because worry is a seed killer. Many of us lose out in the third category because of worry. <coughs> worry chokes faith. Worry is a faith choker. The next test that's hard to pass is riches. You pray for success, and then when it comes, you can't handle the success you got because it has distracted you from the one who gave it to you. So the hardest test to pass, I've been broke. It is not poverty. The hardest test to pass is profitability. Because if you are not intentional about showing God that he can trust you, that you will not idolize what he gave you, you can pass a test. If you don't, what he gave you will choke you. You're thinking about it, you're worrying about it, you're trying to manage it, you're trying to control it. You got rich people's problems with nobody to talk to, it's choking you. And God will take it from you and give it to someone else who will not allow their success to distract them from their service. Ain't many shouters on that one. By the way, rich is a relative term. So all of you who think I'm not talking to you, it depends on who you talk to. Because your normal is somebody else's rich. So be careful about talking about rich people because rich is relative. <laughs> they didn't get nothing I said. They didn't get the words that were coming out of my mouth. If your rich self with a car, Your rich self with a dishwasher. When I was a boy, rich was a doorbell. People that had doorbells was rich people. Window units in the living room was rich people. You know what your problem is? You don't know how blessed you are. You don't, you don't know how blessed you are. You watch too much TV.
When you get any amount of stuff at all, everything you got will bring the temptation to worry about it. If you didn't have a car, you wouldn't need no gas. You wouldn't have to check the tires. You wouldn't need no oil. If you didn't have a car, you wouldn't have to plug it up. I got to cover everybody now. Because I plugs mine. Yeah. But getting an electric car meant I had to get an electrician to put in a plug that I wouldn't have needed. Everything you get causes the need. And if you become distracted by it, having it might take you out of the opportunity to have faith. Pleasures of life. He chokes you with pleasure. If I said I was going to choke you, you would not come up here. <laughs> Nobody, she said, I wouldn't. No, if I told you I was going to choke you, you wouldn't come. Pleasure does not announce itself as a choker. The pleasures of life can choke you. You can have such a good time, you can't go to work. You can have such a good time, you're not worried about being a father. You can have such a good time that you're a bad mother. You can have such a good time. Pleasures of life will put you in a choke house, choke hold, and all of a sudden you can't get loose because you're living for a feeling. You're making decisions based on a feeling and watch and see if it don't choke you. Watch and see if it don't choke you. Watch and see if it don't choke you. Every now and then you got to cast stuff down that you lack. No, no, no. You praying, Lord, make me not like it. Take, take it away from me so I don't want it. No, that wouldn't be a test. The enemy will never test you with something you don't want. You can't be tempted with what you don't like. Not producing anything good. Four, and then I'm gonna get to it. Good soil plus good seed produces in spite of what life may bring. Good soil plus good seed produces in spite of oh God. It produces in spite of what life may bring. If there's anybody in here whose end doesn't line up with your beginning. If anybody knew where you came from and what you've been through, they would never believe that you ended up where you are right now. If there, is there anybody in here that, that you can't even connect the dots between where you started and where you ended up? That means you got good seed and you got good soil and you develop good roots and all you got to do is shout because you still here. I've been through hell, but I'm still here. I've been in a storm, but I'm still here. I've been in a test, but I'm still here. Somebody shout like you're glad about it. In my last seven minutes, I'm going to tell you this. I started talking about Sarah last week. I talked about Sarah because Sarah is the first woman in the Bible 
who made it all the way into the Hall of Fame for her faith. It does not credit Abraham with Isaac. It credits Sarah with Isaac because Sarah is good soil. God waited until Abraham's body was dead and he could not produce a seed. And then he gave him a seed. Now, when he gave him a seed and it hit Sarah's dead womb, it quickened it and brought it back to life. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. I'm going to prove it. I'm going to prove it. I'm going to preach Jesus. I'm going to get in Sarah's belly and preach Jesus. Her dead womb is Mary not knowing a man. Mary is barren because she's never known a man. Sarah is barren because she's never known a man that could impregnate her. So when Abraham's seed hit Sarah's dead womb, he brought it back to life again. Roll forward 42 generations. And Jesus says, I am the seed of Abraham. I am what hit Sarah's womb and brought it back to life. And then he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Sarah's womb was dead, but she believed God, and God brought it back to life again through faith. How did you do it, old woman? I did it through faith. It took her years to get the kind of faith that produces. She had been barren when she wasn't past childbearing age. Now she has two problems. Even if she wasn't barren, she had already gone through the change. There is no way in the world that she ought to be able to have a baby. She is barren. She is past childbearing age. Yes, when she hears the promise, she laughs inside of herself. Yeah, yeah. But from the same place she laughed, yeah, yeah. For the, in the same place that she did not believe, yeah. in the same place where she doubted God, God allowed her to conceive seed when she was past childbearing age because she finally stopped laughing. Let me tell you this right quick. Whatever God said that you've been laughing at, God said, stop laughing. Before the year is out, you're going to see God do that thing. They don't believe it. Before the year is out, you're going to see God do that thing in your life because you believe God is still going to happen. All I'm supposed to do is sow the seed. It's up to you to receive it. I wish I had a hundred people that would receive that seed and just
stand to your feet. This is my close. Sarah, I mean the one in the Bible. When she found out that she couldn't have a baby, she decided to get her maid, Hagar, to have a baby for her. Because she's trying to cover for God that she is not just Abraham not able, because at this point Abraham was able, but believing in Abraham's ableness did not get her pregnant. I know he was able because he got Hagar pregnant. I know he was able because he, he is the progenitor of three major religions. Yes, sir. Christianity. Yes, sir. Judaism through Isaac. Yes. Islam yes. through Ishmael. Yes. In the Quran, they call him Abraham, but it's the same man. All nations of the earth are blessed through this man. It happened for Hagar in time. It happened for Sarah out of time. Check this, somebody in this room, it's going to happen out of time. She laughs at it. She gets a surrogate because of it. Now she's old. And even if she wasn't, Abraham's body is dead. It is totally impossible. It is not judging Abraham faithful that gets her pregnant. It is because she judged God faithful. It's not going to come through your job. It's not going to come through your gift. It's not going to come through your talent. It's going to come through your faith. in God. When she judged God faithful, God strengthened Abraham. Good God Almighty. He so strengthened Abraham. Abraham got Hagar pregnant while he was still strong. He got Sarah pregnant when he was impotent. But it wasn't a one-off. Because after Sarah is dead, he marries a woman named Keturah and has five more children. God said, don't think what he's about to give you is temporary. Your fruit shall remain. And whatever God promised you, he's going to bring it to pass. My question to you, the sower has gone forth this morning sowing seed. What kind of ground are you? Do you hear it and forget it? Do you receive it with joy but have no root? Do you receive it but your situations, and this is where most of us are, we're in the third dimension, most of us are in the third dimension, where we are letting worry, success, and pleasure choke our belief system. In fact, the culture says you should change your belief system to adjust to the culture. So you're trying to develop a theology that fits your fun.
theology has to remain the same. I am the Lord thy God, I change not. Oh my God, I'm back to my first point. She judged him faithful. That's not a womb thing, that's a head thing. I'm back to the fallopian tube in your ear. She heard the word, it stuck. It changed her entire marriage and her house. The word, the engrafted word of God saved her soul. Do you know how many people come in this church and visit it and hear the word and shake it off and go back to being who they were? And the reason it doesn't discourage me, I know the word is good by who stays. I know the word is good by who grows. So there's no problem with the seed. The problem has to be the soil. There are two, two types of people. I want to be honest in this room. You didn't come from money. You broke into a little something. And your success and the worry thereof is choking out your walk with God. You would never admit it to anybody, but fitting in with them has become more important than fitting in with him. And you will change everything about yourself to be acceptable at the water cooler and not at the altar. And now that you got two little quarters to rub together, you've forgotten the God who gave it to you. You don't tithe, you don't sow, you don't give, you don't help. You know why? You can't give up that money because it's your God. It's an idol in your life. The other person I want to hear me good. Every time you're about to be happy, a spirit of worry comes on you. And it can stay on you for weeks. The same problem going over and over and over in your mind. You talk about it, you talk to all your friends about it, you talk to all your relatives about it. When you don't have nobody to talk to about it, you talk to yourself about it. You talk about it at night, you're laying in the bed, you're rolling your hair, talking about it, you're worried about it. You get up in the morning, first thing you think about in the morning, you're worried about it. It's choking the word from being productive in your life. Third class of people. You're so into what feels good, what looks good, what's fun. Didn't you learn something from Eve? The pleasures of this world have cut off the person you were created to be. One of the saddest scriptures I ever read says, this is a day of rebuke and of trouble. For the children have come to birth and there is no strength to deliver. The worst place to go to hell from is in, is in a church where the word is being preached. To come to it, to be around it, to be exposed to it and to walk away from it and die is worse than going from a strip club or a crack house or a dealer. You know why? There was nothing wrong with the seed. You just turned a deaf ear to it. And you think you have an exemption rather than an opportunity. In the final moments of this service, I'm going to test your ground. The sower and the seed are good. The test is the soil. What kind of soil are you? What kind of soil are you? Do you have an emotional reaction to the word? You stand up, you clap, you jump, but, but then when the cares of this life come along, 
You have no root. You have emotions, no root. Your roots are being tested by what you're going through right now. You about to let what you're going through pull you out of what God has designed you to be. I'm talking about the conception of faith. 